Hey guys, Mike Noel here. Blockchain Weekly. It's uh, a Wednesday afternoon, and that means um, we're doing uh, we're wasting another perfectly good time talking about all things blockchain. Um, just wanted to make sure that uh, I, everyone can hear me. Uh, it's a great week uh, as far as blockchain is concerned. Um, adoption continues. Um, we're, we're getting to the point to where I think we've probably pretty near reached the tipping point. Um, uh, there was an article out uh, this week uh, about the Merriam's di uh, Dictionary has added cryptocurrency and blockchain and ICO to the Merriam's Dictionary. So, wow. Um, I, th I think we're at the point where we're getting mass adoption here. Uh, we have words that we've been using for the past couple of years and kind of secret. We got our, our secret handshakes that we do and, and now uh, everything is coming out into public. Blockchain Weekly, we talk about uh, once a week, we talk about things uh, um, not about ICOs. We do, what do you do? Talk about ICO. We had a great guest on last week um, and uh, talked a lot about ICOs, but this week we're gonna be talking about something specific about the Internet of Things and how they connect with uh, the distributed ledger, which is pretty interesting. Um, um, the uh, the Internet Things and the distributed ledger, as it turns out, interface pretty good, and it's uh, it, and it's interesting. Uh, Pete Wassell of Augmate is going to be here, and we're going to have a, a brief chat about some of that stuff. Other things going on in the space. Uh, Tim McCoin, uh, health information exchange on the blockchain. A lot of things happening in in healthcare, uh, electronic medical records, this kind of stuff. Um, uh, that's starting to heat up. Uh, the the real estate uh, uh, niche continues to heat up, and we've got a bunch of people that are talking about doing um, uh, doing title on the blockchain, which is an interesting thing in, in the state of Arizona. Uh, a uh, blockchain, a, a contract. Signature on a blockchain is legal and binding, so a piece of property can be transferred ownership to a blockchain, to a, a smart contract. So that uh, that kind of changes that that uh, drastically. And in health and care, they're going with a blockchain with a distributed ledger so that people can see uh, the different uh, information as they need it from an emergency room or in a doctor's office or something like this and still keeping within HIPAA. So that's that's really interesting stuff that's coming about. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of changes uh, and a lot of a uh, lot of great things uh, that are coming. Swift Harvest is my is a, is a company I'm working with. Swift Harvest continues to move forward in agriculture and doing some interesting things in agriculture. And, you know, let's uh, Let's let's get right on to uh, to Pete. Mike, can you bring Pete up? Let's uh let's 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 have Pete's take on some of this stuff. Hey, hey Pete. Guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Good, 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 good. So uh, we've been talking a little bit about some of the things that are going on, and and we, I I'm, I want to get to uh, to augment in the Internet of Things. I, this is a, a fascinating subject for me, by the way, the Internet of Things. Um, and the way that it interfaces with a distributed ledger. So I'm anxious to get to you, but I, I kind of want to back up just a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, your take on distributed ledger, on blockchain technology as a whole, and some of your thoughts as to where we're going and, and how we're going to get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there, there's a lot of exciting things going on. Um, you know, early on, we had done integrations with IOTA and... Um, because we wanted to really ensure we were using the right protocols, we started benchmarking a, a, a number of different protocols that were out there. Um, so Hyperledger and Hashgraph, uh, EOS with the Graphene blockchain. Um, obviously, there's there's other ones out there, uh, Bitcoin Lightning or uh, Ethereum Radon, and really looking through these to determine what what's really uh, what makes sense for the right industry and the right use cases. Um, in our particular example with IoT, you really need high volume uh, microtransaction and micropayments. Um, some of that will overlap with, let's say, some of fintech and, and that type of thing, uh, depending on you know what's the what's the need of the blockchain. Um, but yeah, a lot of good stuff. Uh, we're 
we're doing the conference circuit right now. So, uh, in fact, uh, I leave tomorrow for Singapore, and then we're on to uh, Seoul, South Korea, and then Shanghai, and then Hong Kong. So, you know, at each one of the conferences, you just see new folks that are coming out and um, showing what they're what they've got. Obviously, the first generation of of uh, protocols were mostly based on uh, digital currencies, but but now you see that second tier, the second generation of companies that are really building businesses on the technology, and that's that's really exciting. So yeah, very stoked. Th things are changing, man. It's uh, uh, it's crazy. You know, uh, one of the things that I always say is, if you were going to build a database in 1984, you'd you'd build it kind of like Oracle or SQL, right? If you're going to build a database in 2018. Not so much. You're gonna you're gonna build it differently, right? And we have the we have the chance to retool the industry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, in particular, no, you you nailed it because in in IoT in particular, and now, you know that's that's what I could really speak to. Um, you know, we're really looking at um, about 40 billion devices uh, by 2020, a uh, quarter trillion devices by uh, 2025, and a trillion devices uh, between the next. Uh, 10 to 20 years. And uh, I, I've revised some of my numbers because the numbers that I received was from uh, Dave Evans, the uh, CTO of Cisco. And when you look at that number of devices and then some of the sensors on these devices, they get pulled 200 times a second. So the sheer volume of information that's going to be coming <laughs> off of the fourth generation of the internet, there's no way you can centralize it. You couldn't put it all in what, one place. Uh, so what, it did, what, that's a big number. That's a trillion times 200 per second. That's a big number. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And now, now, uh, you know, keep in mind, not all of that information deserves to be on blockchain, right? So, so when it comes to bringing products to market and working with customers, you really have to figure out, um, you know, does it go on mist? Does it go on fog? Does it go on cloud? Uh, does the processing get done on a device? Uh, does it get done within a smart contract? Uh, does it get done within the Augmate platform? So these are all things that we look at to really determine what makes sense. So, we, you know, with blockchain, it's fine if it's off chain within a company or within a smart home uh, to be on blockchain when, when the expense is low. Um, it, it only then makes sense if you're sharing information with your partners and ecosystem is when you're starting to put it on the, the public blockchain. Yeah, if you if if it needs to be shared, right? That's that's the that's the that's the point. If if it needs to be shared, and there's uh, especially if there's a transfer of trust. If you're if you have one person on one end of the transaction, another person on another end of the transaction, and they're they're the transaction depends upon data. It always does it's data in some form or another. Uh, then that's definitely an on chain. If you have um, an IT of uh, Internet of uh, Things device communicating with a internet of thing uh, device every 200 times a second, letting it know, Hey, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Probably not so much basically is what you're saying, right? Exactly. So that can go in like a, either a cold storage or into a, a kind of centralized database that if you want to roll that information up, we can still run it through a smart contract where it makes sense uh, to tag data and then uh, put things in the categories, right? So, so if you want to, essentially, you know, get the health of your IoT network or, you know, centralized information in a certain kind of way. Again, off chain where you're going to have uh, lower expenses, that totally makes sense. But like you said, the sheer volume of data is such that um, the, the data becomes when you're actually um, passing it within your partners and your ecosystem. So there's a number of use cases specifically in IoT where this does make sense. And that's that's why it's a really great fit. Right. Right, right. Um, so, uh, and that, that that's a good segue. Let's let's go into Augmate and talk about the early days. You know, back, you know, the early early days. How long has Augmate been around? Gee, about uh, four years now. Uh, so yeah, yeah. We started as a, wow. Uh, in, in in the whole scheme of things, four years is like you're you're like the grandfather of of the entire <laughs> industry. You know what I mean? Not very many people sure. have been been doing it for that long. So my hat's off to you on that. So let's go back to four years ago. Talk a little bit about what's happening and 
what was the genesis and how did you get to where you're at right now? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, my background is I'm a former IBMer, um, worked out of a number of locations, but, um, you know, worked out of the uh, Santa Teresa lab in Silicon Valley. And um, when I came back to New York, our, our family's on the East Coast. Um, I started Augmate. Uh, once you spend a little bit of time in Silicon Valley, you kind of get a, a taste of uh, startups and entrepreneurship and, and that stays with you. Uh, so got a little bit tired of working at corporate, started Augmate. And really, uh, the design point was uh, a wearables management platform. And, and what I mean by that is uh, we were one of the first glass at work partners with Google. Uh, so one of 10 companies in the world uh, certified to work with them on their smart glass device. And what we learned early on was that uh, companies didn't really have the tools or processes to deploy fleets of wearables. So we were doing the end user applications on smart glasses. And these are things like, um, you know, pick and pack application in a warehouse, um, uh, telepresence, you know, see what I see, video sharing applications, uh, workflow applications, um, you know, these, these types of things. And you could have a great pilot, uh, but even if you can improve efficiency, you know, save a worker 30 minutes a day or, uh, you know, reduce errors by 8%, whatever the metric was, at the end of the day, when you, when you went to roll out those solutions uh, in production, the IT directors would say, you know, hey, we're, we're good at rolling out tablets and these kinds of devices, but when it comes to wearables, you know, we just don't have uh, what it takes to do that. And so we put together a platform that really did um, device management, policy, security, over-the-air updates, those types of things. And, you know, the, the, the core of it was really about security and infrastructure of devices. And, and so what we've believed is that uh, wearables are a subset of IoT, and we wanted to get wearables down really well before moving on to all IoT devices, uh, get that infrastructure layer down, get that security layer down. And now, you know, now we're using distributed ledger technology to expand to all IoT devices. So we're essentially going from 10 or 12, um, you know, smart wearable devices to, you know, two to 3000 IoT devices. So, and, and kind of, let's let's uh, unpack the the distributed ledger component um and where where's the advantages of using a distributed ledger and how are you referencing your off-chain data on the ledger does that make sense yeah so um we're we're using we're using blockchain in about five different components of of the solution um and and by the way when when we were putting together the roadmap um Blockchain was always a part of it, but we hadn't always considered to do an ICO, a token offering. Um, we, and I, so I can get, I'll get into the parts of, of um, distributed ledger or blockchain. Um, so first of all, at the highest level, we, we wanted to use blockchain even for our own purposes. So external from our system, our platform, it's a access token used to, to access, access services on our platform. But internally, we had to actually figure out how to charge a customer. So what I mean by that is, in a traditional sense, if you had, let's say, software that cost $100 for that license, and you had a customer that had 15 computers, you would know what to charge that customer. You charge them 1500 bucks, right? With IoT, uh, every customer is going to be different. Uh, they could have everything from a 50 cent sensor to a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment and it's all iot right and so just as you would have let's say um a 25 cents worth of bitcoin and you would know every hand that it passed through and it was used to buy a packaged game you'd be able to follow it through the system right so just as you do that you're actually using it as a point tracker in sure. order to follow it system through all of our services because at the end of the day you have to really determine am i charging by transaction am i charging by device am i charging by the data they store or am i charging by the data they share and so just to follow it through the system ourselves we needed it for our own purposes but then when you really start to dig into blockchain and understand the the, the value of um, you know trust in a trustless environment you talked about data um the amount of data that's going to be generated is ridiculous, okay? So there's some of the models where, for example, 
And I could use um, industry models and I could use smart home models, but there's hundreds of models. So for example, you know, you might have a, um, an airline and they've got a power washer, right? And they're washing the planes as, as they come in. Well, they might not own that piece of equipment, so it's leased. Uh, but yet them, the, the airline and the, the power washer company want to know how many hours are being used. Maybe right. if there's any sure. errors or anything. So all of that sure. data has to be put on online and, and it has to be trusted. And, and you'd have, you know, uh, escrow or automatic payments that are based on that kind of, you know, information. Um, in a smart home, uh, you know, you might have a health care so, application. So let's, let's, let, let's take a look at that. Unpack that just a second, because you've, you've really you've hit on some things that are really important, I think. And a lot of times we just kind of glance over them. Right. So you have a an airline that owns a power washer, right? And they've leased it. And that power washer is is charged per hour that they that they have on it. There's a little meter on the side of it that sits there and ticks. And every once in a while, someone goes out, walks out to the, to the power washer and says, oh, it has this many hours on it, right? That's self-reported data. That's the way the whole industry is, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So someone someone walks out to it and says, look, oh, it says 10. Okay, it goes back, writes 10, and then someone gives that information to the leasing company. The next week, the guy goes out there and goes, ah, maybe I don't want to go out there and take a look at it. Maybe I'll go get a cup of coffee or something, right? Um, and this is the problem with self-reported data. And, and the vast majority of the statistics that we keep are based on self-reported data in some fit, form, or function. We have self-reported data that's truly self-reported. They have self-reported data that's that's collected and then sent through a management team, right? And then that management team looks at the data, augments it, changes it to fit their criteria, and then sends it out and publishes that data. It's all self-reported. And, and this is the, the problem you have when you have a database that resides in someone's server environment and it's uh, uh, it's sitting in a in a Diebold safe and has a bunch of whack and heart guards around it guarding the data, right? And uh, uh, even if we have that meter somehow wirelessly in Bluetooth report back to that, it's going to report back to that server, and then that server is going to go through internal channels. There's going to be a manager that that reports that data and, and manipulates the data, sales data. Um, uh, agriculture is, is, is huge in this, in this respect. We don't really understand a lot about what's going on in agriculture because there's no real uh, data points out there in the middle of the field. It's all self-reported. Um, medical, uh, th this is the, the same problem where we're seeing in medical. Uh, this is the same problem we're seeing in logistics. Logistics has been gamed for centuries, right? Centuries. I mean, uh, going back to the days of the horse and buggy, you, you, you know, you, and, and the way the trucking the truckers are going, they, they want to do more than 10, 12 hours a day. Now we have EDL that's going to track them and we'll be able to to take this data. But still, we have EDL that's report back to a central office that has a server, right, that has management teams that look at the data and and, and, and manipulate the data and then report that data. So we, we have we have data streams that aren't correct. That's the problem, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And your, so your solution. Black, One more time. Black. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. So, supply so, chain and and for, for blockchain. Yeah. And a lot of people just kind of glance over this. It's just data. I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, we can we can do this. We've been working self-reporting for, you know, 30, 40 years. It's worked so far. Well, it's not working. We don't have the data to understand um, uh, what's going on. And we can't if we don't have data, we can't measure. And if you don't measure, you can't improve. Right. So go ahead. Uh, let's let, let's continue and start talking. Yeah, go ahead. You got it exactly right. And and I'll tell you what. I'll I'll put it this way. Um, in the next three to four years, you won't be able to buy a piece of equipment, a device, an appliance that's not connected to the internet. You know. So again, you know, we're really about the fourth generation of of the internet and and IoT. Um, and the amount of data that's going to be churned out is tremendous. And when you start adding in artificial intelligence and you start thinking about combining the data to get new insights on things and new efficiencies and new productivity for companies, um, that's where, where the value is going to come in. Um, so it's a, a tremendous opportunity. And I'd, I would put it this way. You know, you got to think back to uh, circa 2006, right? Where, you know, pre-iPhone or, or circa... Yeah. 
1993, pre-internet. And when you think about the fourth generation, okay, so you take, you know, take your, your mobile device. Um, you didn't know your life was going to depend on it. You didn't know that you were going to fall in love with the device, right? You had, you had no clue. And this fourth, so we believe this is the fourth generation, uh, third generation. So in the fourth generation, this infrastructure layer of all devices connected, okay, the applications and services that go on top of this layer, you're going to feel the same way about. You're going to feel the same way about how you felt about the third generation and smartphone when you see the applications and services on top of this layer. And that's what we're building for. Absolutely. And, it, and it's coming. It's coming very quickly. So we've talked a little bit about the applications and what happened at the beginning. So let's talk about some of the things that you're doing um, uh, doing today. What 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 is it that's interesting that's going on today? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll tell you what. Just to you know, talk a, a little bit more about um, you know a, a, about blockchain. Um, you know, there's there's so many different ways that it could be used, and it's disrupting so many different industries. Um, you know, we're we really think about the models where, um, you know, you think about the barriers to entry for any particular business, right? And you say, how do we use technology as an engine, right, to solve problems in the marketplace, right? So you're always taking new technology to do that. And so blockchain is still, you know, relatively a, a new technology. Um, you know, some of the blockchain services that exist out there and that are related to protocol. You know, we're building blockchain bridges within our platform and then even using our tokens as a way to pay for the gas on those things. So it's true. So as far as a user is concerned, they don't have to worry about, hey, uh, you know, my customer has this kind of protocol or we're using this kind of system. Doesn't matter from from their perspective. They don't need to know anything like that. They don't need to know that I have to translate from this protocol to this other protocol or this plug in to this IoT platform to this other IoT platform, we're handling that. And then we're even using our token to, you know, pay for the cost of those types of things. So, so you know, we're, we're, when we, we talk about the sheer number of devices and all this data that exists, um, you know, we, we have to think about how do you make it really simple? $15 trillion market by 2030, okay? And when you say something like that, and you, you say, <laughs> so, yeah. And so, um, you know, uh, with, with all, all of that, basis, making it simple is critical. Okay, so that's, that's number one. Second thing is, when you look at all those devices, every single device that you add on to IoT is a potential hacking point, right? It's an endpoint for a hacker to get in there. So security has got to be you know, on, on top. So we focus on the things to really make it so that, uh, you know, companies have an easier way to get onto IRT. And uh, we think blockchain is a, a big part of that, you know, for security reasons, you know, just as you would have a, you know, let's say a financial transaction, let's say a Bitcoin or Ethereum transaction between two people, you know, encrypted, you know, on, on both sides, a public key, a private key, you know, you could do the same thing with machine to machine communication or machine to human communication. Um, you know, so from a security aspect, you know, we, we think it makes a lot of sense. We can run transactions through a smart contract where you would essentially use it as a gate, you know, kind of a gatekeeper. It doesn't have the latest security patch, right? If it doesn't have uh, the latest information on it, I'm not going to pass data to that device or take data from that device. So from a, from an IoT health standpoint, you've got an ability to monitor the system to ensure that, you know, it's up to par and, and, and it's, you know, on top of things. Well, we got a, we've got a couple of questions here. I want to get back to that, but let's, uh, let's take a couple of questions and anyone in the audience, you can ask questions at any time that you like, uh, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So how did you segregate the off-chain transactions from on-chain transactions for Augmate? That's a good question. Uh, it is it is an excellent question. Um, so so when you look at the protocols out there, so number one, um, IoT is one of those uh, you know kind of kind of uh, let's say businesses where you definitely need high volume uh, because of the sheer number of devices, uh, microtransaction and, and micro payments. Even that being said, uh, you still have to be cognizant of cost, right? 
And so where data doesn't have to be, let's say, shared, uh, we want to use protocols that make sense that um, th that don't have cost for within a private network. Um, so it'd be almost, a, you know, like a distributed database, you know, from that standpoint. And then it's only when it's going on to um, the, the public internet for sharing within partners in the ecosystem. So that first example where you have, um, you know, let's say the airline and the power washer, that would make sense to, to put onto the public network. Um, but even in a home, okay, so let's say, you know, you've got your 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 health scale, right? It's an it's a IoT scale because it's connected to the internet. The scale is connected to your Fitbit, that's connected to your Nest thermostat, that's connected to your smart fridge, and your health mirror, okay? <laughs> And hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Just, 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 just go back over that again. <laughs> okay, the scale that you step on for your weight, okay. right? It's right. Connected to your Fitbit, that's connected to yep. your Nest, that's connected yep. to your smart fridge. Yep. Oh. Um, there's different attributes of each one of those devices. But, um, you know, let's say you have that and it's, a, it's, your, it's kind of a constellation of devices for your health use case, okay? Now that data, You'd have to ask, and, and we'll, we'll, I'll add one on for you, Mike. You take a pill and, and you swallow it, and it's not a regular uh, multivitamin. It's measuring your glucose levels and your hormone, hormone levels, and that's connected sure. to your smart. okay? Yes. Now you've got all this data. You have to decide, am I sharing that data with my doctor? Am I sharing that data with my insurance company because I want a discount? You know, if I'm, if I'm willing to share that data, they're going to give me a discount, so I want to do that. And do I want to sell some of that data to the pharmaceutical company? Because I don't mind if they're going to pitch me on one of their medicines if, if it's going to help me. It's connected to my genome and whatever. And I always say, you know, I'll tell you what, I, I lived in Silicon Valley for a number of years, have had startups. Um, I get the whole hype cycle and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you can, you can be cynical, right? If it, 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 the ups and downs of startups and, and taking new products to market and all that kind of thing. But I always tell everyone on my team, think Three to four years out, you have to be you have to be building for what's going to be uh, occurring in, in the next three years. If you're building for what's occurring now, then forget it. Then then you know then, then you're you're not going to have much value. You're taking new technology and solving problems in the marketplace, but you know but you got to be thinking at least three to four years out. So so hopefully that helps people appreciate the kind of use cases that that are going to be existing. But in that use case, it's when you're taking that data. And then you're outside of the smart home where then you have to figure out, okay, well, this deserves to go on, uh, you know, public uh, blockchain. So it, it's, uh, uh, there, there are a couple of things that are involved. One is cost. What, what, how much, how much gas is it going to cost to store it? Um, uh, the other is application. Uh, who's going to use it? Is it, is it, um, is it just you that want to see it or is there going to be other people that want to see it? Uh, those types of applications. Is the data sensitive? Does it need to be encrypted? There's all kinds of different things that, that go into making a decision on how to, how we segregate off-chain transactions and on-chain on -chain transactions, right? I hope that uh, answered your... Go ahead. No, and that's, that's part of the, the secret sauce because not everything has to go on to blockchain. And so, and so that so when you're weighing those different options of cost, the gas, and and, and that type of thing, and, and what protocol is being used, part of the secret sauce in our system is helping the the end user, the customer, make those decisions about what's going to be in in you know. All right, uh, one more question, and I'm putting it up there. Just curious, how did you arrive at your token value for the ICO? Lots of people asking questions about the ICOs. Uh -huh. Yeah, so um, I'll tell you what, this is one of the, the hardest things. Uh, but for us, what we did was we, uh, number one, we, we brought on a bunch of advisors. So we, we specifically, just for the six months of doing our token offering, we brought on 12 uh, advisors. So people that had previously done ICOs, uh, people that are involved all sorts of different folks um so that was the first thing and we asked them questions okay um so augmates license for our our platform is one hundred fifty thousand dollars per year for a corporate customer all right 
And so that's that's number one. So that that had to go into um, in, into the equation. The second thing is, we were told we needed to have at least as many tokens that would last for ten years. Okay, in order to to do this, so we've got a finite supply, and we we burn them when they're used. Um, and so, but we had to have enough, and so we had to have that total number. So when you start putting in the variables of um, into the equation of, of what price is going to be. We, what we ended up doing was we we ended up putting out the token for what's going to be um, a, a pretty significant discount. So in other words, you've got par value where um, at full price, the token would be worth much. So we've got five different ways that, that our token has, has value and increases in, in value. But essentially, it's going on to the market for uh, one-fifth the price of what our software license is. And that was by design. So we actually call it um, a, a fractional license access token with cryptographic mm -hmm. coupon app. Okay, so it's got an ability to have okay. a, a discount. Yeah. So we've got the price built in where there's already an upside for folks. And I, I got to be careful with the language, you know, that I, that I use on there, but we actually, we're putting it at a low level with the you know, in order to encourage it to increase in value while it's on the market. Okay. I hope that answers that question. Now, we were talking a little bit about um, uh, uh, IoT stuff in the house, and we got uh, sidetracked with a question. And, and feel free to ask questions again, and if anyone wants a video question, we'll get you up on video, and we can uh, we can share this. Um, anyone has a, a video question, just feel free to, to raise your hand, and let's go, go, go. Um, but uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, IoT in the house. We were going to move on to healthcare when we got um, uh, onto the question. So can we can we pick back up on going on to healthcare and talking a little bit about moving out and, and uh, the different change there? So go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, but let me let me just finish a, a thought on on smart homes. Um, sure. We we came to the standpoint in the IoT to really say. Um, you know, number one, what would you capture? The cost of storage is going down tremendously, right? And so um, it's it's exponential with with how much data we're able to store now. So we come from a standpoint: what would you capture if you had unlimited storage? Okay, and you start thinking about video, and you start thinking about audio, and all sorts of different things that you could capture. And with this data included with IoT, that's going to assist humans in ways that are hard to imagine right now. Okay, and so this. Things that there's uh, security use cases, there's uh, entertainment use cases. Um, we're going to see a lot of interesting things. And by the way, you know, when you've got 25 devices connected to, uh, you know, your 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 wireless router, you know, you have to ask yourself, you you really want 25 applications? And so it's one it's one of our goals to really have one application and really power to the people. You know, you're in control of the data, so all that data exists. You the, the internet's become kind of clumpy, right? So if you ever look at uh, Alexa. I'm not talking Alexa, Amazon's, you know, uh, you know, Echo device. I'm talking about the traffic, you know, monitoring website, where uh, you see where all the the data is going. It goes to Amazon. It goes to Google, and it goes to you know all these certain places. There's an opportunity to actually correct and actually uh, decentralize the internet with the fourth generation of the internet and all these devices. So it gets really interesting about the the kind of possibilities. Um, Healthcare, in particular, I think is great for IoT. This is this is an industry that's ripe for disruption. Okay, um, you've got all these devices, and and it's true across all of IoT, but very you know very much in particular for for healthcare, devices that don't talk to each other, uh, but yet if they did talk to each other, there's an opportunity to help patients and, and um, have better care and uh, save lives and all that kind of thing. So there's an opportunity there, but what makes it even worse? Not only do you have fragmented devices that don't talk to each other and uh, you know no, no good protocols or security, you've got such high regulation you know, in the United States, Europe, and, and, and other places that has made it very difficult. So you've got all these silos where um, you know, essentially it's difficult to get things done. So this is for someone to come in and it just so, so happens that uh, Augmate was granted a, uh, um, a special space at uh, Toro Medical College in order to test IoT devices within a hospital setting. It's an academic college. 
uh, to medical school, and we're testing devices uh, at that facility. Uh, so it's a, a great opportunity. And uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted on how that goes. But when you start to think about it, um, significant opportunities. Remember, we've had our most experience with uh, smart glasses. Uh, our initial partner in the medical space was a company called Avena. Okay, so they're not regular smart glasses. These smart glasses have the ability to see infrared. Okay, so they can see the veins in your arm. The, the problem they were looking to solve was um, when they go to stick you with a needle, uh, like, you know, a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, they miss 40% of the time on the first try. Okay, so they were looking to solve that problem for, for patient care. Now, uh, in that, I don't want to say they were a one trick pony, but that was their main core competency. All right, doing solving that problem. The opportunity is it's an Android operating system. They've got um, a display within smart glasses. You can have applications in there. You could have data that flows to nurses and, and, and that type of thing. And it's only been within this year we're starting to see the maturity of devices get to a point where um, you can't tell that they're smart glasses. You, cannot, you can't tell from the outside, you know, when, when uh, you know, Glass first came out from Google, uh, you know, pretty nerdy. Yeah, and awesome. knew exactly what it was. Uh, the devices that are coming out this year, you, you, and, and so, you know, from a, a patient care standpoint, when you've got an interfacing, um, you know, application with a patient, they're sitting right in front of you. Um, it's kind of nice that they don't feel, you know, threatened or, or, or bothered, but yet uh, the, the uh, medical staff have the ability to care for that patient even better using the technology. Uh, so that's like one example, but you could imagine uh, vitals or, um, you know, let's say, you know, the last mile when it comes to providing uh, medicine, is it the correct dosage? Am I giving it to the right, you know, patient? Right. Is this medicine the right medicine for this patient? Um, yeah. You know, all that kind of information, even having, you know, beacons within rooms to be able to alert staff of, of what's going on. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll see transformations within hospitals in the medical space that'll be uh, will be great and, and very IoT related. I, I think you're right there. There's a in the especially in healthcare, there's a lot of sneaker wear. I mean, um, maybe I've just showed my age, but uh, you know, sneaker wear when I was beginning programming, by the way, my first program was about this high, it was in, on, on cards. Um, and, and networking wasn't that, you know, sometimes you had to pick up your, your program and use your sneakers to, to, to transfer it to another, another machine. But uh, in uh, medical IoT, I mean, you know, the nurse comes in, she says, well, how are you feeling? Well, you should know how I feel. I mean, there should be there should be monitoring. Why am I telling you how I feel? Now I have to be subjective in telling you how I feel. And OK, we're going to give you a medicine. What is your name and what's your birth date? I need to check and make sure that I'm giving you the right stuff. OK, this makes me feel real confident in, in what I'm getting here. The, the, the nurse is not really sure who I am. And and, and um, I'm, I'm wondering now, am I getting the right dosage? Am I getting the right stuff? Am I going to wake up in the morning? Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of IoT that is, uh, again, it's self-reported. Um, and, and a lot of times it's self-reported data that we're collecting in life and death types of circumstances. And, and that has a lot of room for improvement there. Let's put it that way. Um, any, anything that you don't measure, you can improve. First thing we got to do is start getting getting the data and, and start collecting the data. This is a way to do it. So, yes, great, great, great stuff. So uh, keep going. So, sorry to interrupt. No, and, and um, I mean, there's just so many opportunities when you when you start thinking about the data. Um, we had done a lot of work with wearables and, and smart wearables. And, you know, you have to remember, um, you know, when you've got an accelerometer and a gyroscope, uh, the device doubles as a pedometer, right? So let's say you know your your workers are walking, uh, you know, 45 minutes a day. You know, <clears throat> that might be good yeah. or that might be bad. You might change the layout of your factory based on that information. Um, you know, with when, when you've got, um, you know, that kind of technology, you know, just let's say on smart glasses or watch and you even get heartbeat, with big data and artificial intelligence, you can actually know, is my worker fatigued? Are they stressed? Are they about ready to make a mistake? So, so again, with data, <clears throat> you want lots of data, volumes of data. And I'm not one of these uh, folks who think that uh, 
artificial intelligence and computers and computers are going to overtake the human race. I truly believe that it's going to be uh, something that will assist humans uh, for their health, for efficiency, uh, for all sorts of reasons to make our lives easier. And but it's uh, there's there's so many examples. Um, goodness, if you knew the the uh, the Watson example where there was a woman. Oh, yeah. She had le leukemia and um, they, tr they gave her all the different medicines that <clears throat> that they could for leukemia. And it turned out they didn't help her. They didn't work. And within three weeks, she was going to die. And they gave the medical rec records to Watson. And um, Watson spit out a recommendation and said, well, this woman had a very rare form of leukemia and that they hadn't tested for and ended up giving her a drug and saved her life. And the reason that it was able to do it is because it had sifted through 20 million records. So something that a human right. just would not have any ability to do. So we have to understand with this next generation of the internet, this fourth generation of the internet and IOT, the amount of data that's gonna be generated, it will be impossible for humans to go, go through it. So you, we're gonna need assistance. We're gonna need help in order to do that. And how that data is stored and processed is really critical um, to the kinds of applications and, and services that exist. You know, we're planning on really putting out uh, uh, with our platform the ability for third parties to come in and say, oh, you know, we've solved a, a problem, some niche problem for this industry or, or this use case, and then use our system and offer decentralized apps. And they'll be able to use our token within their decentralized apps. So again, you know, when I say that we've got, you know, five or six different methods where we're using the blockchain, you know, we're legitimately using it both out external to our, our platform and internal within our platform. And there's very few ICOs or, or token offerings that can really say to the extent that they're using blockchain in their solution. Right. And, and I, we have another question. I want to get to it, but I, I just want to ask you just a, a clarifying point here. Um, Thinking about all that you're doing and all the data you're collecting and all the data points that you're collecting and, and how you're collecting them, would it be possible to collect that data in a normal server environment? So, yeah, it's always always a good question. Like, uh, you know, do you have to use blockchain? You know, do you have to use distributed ledger and, and, and that type of thing? Um, we've just got too many use cases where, uh, where, where it wouldn't make sense. And, and again, the sheer number of devices and sheer number of data, it doesn't make sense to put in a centralized system. All right, okay, so it makes more sense to put this decentralized. Um, and then there's, you know, you still have the security, but yet you've got the accessibility of the data across a number of different places. So for, for that reason and, and for other use cases as well, I think it totally makes sense for distributed ledger in this case. So so, so basically, in your mind, it's a it's a data accessibility issue, right? It, it it definitely is, and and with the the barriers to entry with IoT, you know, um, you, all these devices, <clears throat> device management, easy device management. I'm talking, you know, Apple easy, stupid easy, you know, kind of uh, you know system in place and security are, are two of the biggest barriers for IoT, and those are two of the things right. that we're solving. And it's such a, right. a monster problem. You got a lot of different players in, into this and it becomes very complex. And you really, you, you kind of need a, you know, in, on one sense, a central hub, right? That's going to be able to, you know, talk to a lot of different systems. But at the same time, when it comes to the data, that has to be distributed. Right, right. Okay, great. Uh, and yeah, that's always a good question. That's uh, one of the things that uh, I get asked more often than not is, okay, so... Help me understand why we need distributed ledger and why can't I, I can't do this in a, in a normal server environment. Um, and most of the time, you can't, uh, especially in IoT. Uh, you, it, it's the same problem that we had before where we're taking data, uh, we're collecting data, we're storing in a server that's uh, in a Diebold safe, has a bunch of whack and hut guards standing around it, and it's up for someone to go in, look at the, look at the data, um, interpret the data and then send uh, out the reports as, as opposed to us actually lensing the data on a distributed ledger and then uh, uh, and, and then making our own assumptions and our own correlations. And on top of the fact that 
you can make interesting correlations if you have access to raw data. Um, and if you just have a report that has numbers on it that someone's giving you, you're not, you, you're not, you don't have access to the raw data. A lot of things going on um, that uh, we couldn't even have done 10 years ago. So it's, a, it's an interesting niche. Well, uh, I'm going to get another question going here. Uh, this one's a long one, so I'm going to warn you. So um, how are partnerships made? Should your partner company buy your tokens? Example, if you have an ICO, which is in the supply chain domain, and wants to have wants to integrate with your technology. You touched a little bit on this at the at the beginning of the hour. So let's uh, let's let's dive a little deeper into that. Could we? Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. So um, the the way that we've done uh, partnerships in, in the past, uh, we probably are not going to continue quite on that same track. And we'll and, and we're trying to make some strategic decisions. And I'm going to explain what that means. So with the smart wearables that are on our platform, the way that we worked was uh, we would put provisioning software on those devices. So they were mostly Android devices. And what I mean by provisioning software is, um, you know, it would get down to an Android or uh, operating system or hardware services layer. And, and it would be signed by the keys of the hardware manufacturer. And that would grant us special privileges on that device. So a normal application that would go on the smartwatch or the smart glasses doesn't need that kind of access, okay? But because what we what we discovered early on was that IT directors needed the ability to remote wipe a device, reset someone's password, um, centrally manage uh, teams of users or distributed users or install applications and all that kind of stuff, our provisioning software needed to get down to that layer. So we had OEM hardware agreements with those types of companies, okay? So now when you've got 10, 12 companies that are your partners, your hardware partners, you can manage that. As we move to 2,000 devices and 3,000 devices, and then you think about supply chain, one of Augmate's investors, and by, by the way, you know, when I said um, we didn't know we were going to do a token offering, you know, it wasn't joking around. We, we did a, a seed round. It was all venture capital. You know, I'm talking, you know, it was, uh, you know, Tim Draper, Rothenberg Ventures, XL Partners, uh, Funding Post, Siemens Venture Capital, but UPS was one of our investors, right? And so from a supply chain standpoint, you know, these are folks uh, that understand logistics. Um, log logistics was a word that was actually coined by Napoleon. And he, and he said, uh, armies, armies travel on their belly. And it wasn't that they were crawling through the mud. It was that... Uh, the, the army is only 30% uh, of, of uh, a war. You need your su food supplies. You need your health supplies. You need all, all this other stuff. And that's logistics, right? And, and the movement of all those things is what's really important. And, and so when it comes to supply chain and logistics, um, fine tuning that is, is what really matters. And, and of course, blockchain makes the most sense because, you know, when you're tracking your package, obviously, you know where that package is at. You know it left the distributed, you know, the distribution center. You know it's on the truck. You know it's, you know, out for delivery, all that kind of information. So that makes sense to, to, to put that out there. Now, when it comes to the kind of devices that uh, you work with, uh, like Zebra will we'll make like a, a scanner yeah. or there's a finger scanner, right? That's Bluetooth. Um, and maybe that works with um, a smart glass device or, or smart watch and, and those types of things. So there's these different solutions out there. Um, you know, we had seen early on hack uh, iPhones that were connected into, you know, some sort of laser scanner and used to, you know, scan packages and the app was on the, you know, on the smartphone. So there's all these different devices that are out there. And at the end of the day, those devices need to talk to each other. And, and then that data gets, you know, put into a place where, you know, whoever needs to access it, accesses it. Um, I'd say the best way to, to work with us is an email and phone call in the beginning. Um, and then we figure out the token strategy. So, so in other words, you know, let's say if we're, if we're doing a project with UPS or we're doing a project with, uh, you know, a big box store or retail or, or, or something along those lines, um, you know, we would say, you know, what do we, what do we want access to? Do you want access to this particular customer? Um, or, and you want to present that solution, you know, to this customer or, or is it, is it more general purpose marketplace in the app to exist? And then, you know, then we're doing co-marketing and going out to a particular industry and then selling that solution. You know, the, the, um, 
you know, the complementary services of what Augmate does and then what your supply chain company does. And so there's a couple different options there, but I would say a, a, a call to get started is absolutely the best way. Very good. I hope uh, I hope we got all the questions answered today. Um, it's uh, it's coming up to the top of the hour. It happens really quick, doesn't it? Feels like we just sat down a few minutes ago and, it, and it's already coming up on an hour. Um, and once again, we've wasted a perfectly good hour talking about all things blockchain here on Blockchain Weekly. Um, I want to give you a, a, a final shout and I want to ask you, um, you know, you got a couple of minutes here. What is your outlook for the future? Where do you think think things are going and, and what's the uh, what's the big thing, the next big thing out there? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, here, here's what I've I've noticed. Um, so so number one, when we made the decision to use blockchain, you know, within our roadmap um, and, and we decided to do a token offering, we, we did that in part in order to absolutely immerse the team by going to conferences and meetups and work with partners that were using blockchain. OK, and and so we, we already knew we were using blockchain in part of our solution, but we wanted it. It's not good enough to just work within a bubble or, or, or you know, that kind of thing, you know, in isolation or, or a vacuum. So to immerse yourself within the community makes the most amount of sense. And what we've learned is that and it, you, you kind of knew it from, let's say, the startup world of working with VCs and everything. The amount of capital needs. There's a lot of great ideas. Right. Blockchain is disrupting so many different businesses and, and industries, right? So the need for capital exists out there. So the traditional methods of, of getting capital into businesses, you know, it's just becoming democratized. Going to VCs and, you know, 10 dimensions of a, of a, a business plan and your pitch deck and all that kind of stuff is tough. And, and we're just seeing an explosion in the marketplace of, of uh, startups going and raising capital through, through a token offering. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, you know that uh, raising capital, the VC market, private equity, that kind of stuff. That's a that's a an industry that's been broke for quite some time now, um, and just another one that's being changed by uh, uh, you know different consensus algorithms and and that coming together with community. So great, uh, great concept, great ideas, great company. Really appreciate your time. I want to give a quick shout out to uh, to Mike and the crew at Shindig. They're the ones that provide this. Uh, uh, this platform for us every week so we can get together and, and talk about all things blockchain. Um, really appreciate you, Mike. Uh, you're always on the top of my lips when I'm talking about talking to people about uh, uh, different things and different uh, 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 different ways of, of doing this and educating. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, really appreciate. Oh, he wants to come on and, and give a, a parting shot here. Come on in, Mike. Although it looks like we're going to be seeing your chair. Oh, there you are. There you are. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, just a quick thanks to um, everyone. We have Pete for coming on, Mike for hosting these every week. Um, they'll be recorded. Um, um, so uh, on Mike, your on Mike's YouTube channel, Blockchain Consultants YouTube channel. I think you just have to go on YouTube and do a Blockchain Weekly, and it'll they'll pop up right there uh, for those if you have colleagues that couldn't attend. Um, yep, yeah, and just uh, thanks for being involved. Very good. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. We'll uh, see you next week, uh, Wednesday, same time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you.